this one. How do you think this one? All right, guys, we're ready to go. Uh, Abanti, any news of uh, Stuti? Okay, she's here. Lovely. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to our webinar, Exploring and Expressing Diversities young voices from all over the world. And we really have a lot of people who've gathered here from USA, UK, Nigeria, and of course, India, who will be sharing their views about diversities, inclusivity, or whatever they think uh, is important to them or makes a difference to the lives. This is a webinar, which is a part of Trame Bazi, International Arts Festival for the Young, conceived in 2018 along with my co-curator Bishali Chatterjee Dutt as a carnival. We conceived it as a celebration of arts. And last year, it uh, went online and we became international because we could reach out to so many people from all over the world. We had audiences and uh, uh, collaborators, uh, from so many countries. This year again, we are um, showcasing, in fact, more than seven countries. We have UK, USA, Thailand, India, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Australia, and uh, quite a few. Then we have 28 events where we have uh, webinars, uh, you know, discussion forums like this, and then closed door workshop also, which is. Uh, for the youth on sex education, uh, which talks about consent and uh, healthy relationships. The festival includes workshops on various art forms, be it baking, music, dance, puppetry, uh, filmmaking, and many, many more. And it also includes uh, events that are performances, online performances coming in again from USA Muhlenberg College, uh, which is being represented today also, um, uh, D. Cameron by Ethan and uh, another performance, Tiny Universe from Australia. Uh, we have uh, uh, Seed Savers, Anurupa Roy's puppets uh, that are uh, uh, the Girl in the Pink Frog, Seed Savers is by Gilo Gilleri, which is uh, being directed by my co-curator, Shelly Satyu, who is behind the screen just now. I hope she'll appear uh, soon. So, and um, also a lot of uh, screenings. One of uh, the screenings that we are very proud of getting to the festival is an Academy Award winning Innocente, again from USA, by Shine Global, which will be screened tomorrow. So we're very excited because these webinars will pre the warming up activity towards the festival. The festival takes off tomorrow formally with the launch event, which starts at 5 p.m. And uh, uh, I request uh, Shelly Satyu to tell us a little more about the festival. What is the theme and uh, how do we look at things? At the Academy, I could say that for us, this is a part of the process-based work, starting from five years old to going till the 30 years old, where we work with them throughout the year um, through engagement with arts and talking about issues that concern us uh, in our lives. And then this becomes like the culmination and the celebration of that process-based work. So over to you, Shelley. Uh, do share with us uh, what more the festival this year holds together and what have been our thoughts. This webinar I also want to uh, share is a part of the Youth Connect project of the Creative Arts Academy. And in fact, they were the people behind this webinar and many other things which Shelley will discuss. So over to sh you, Shelley, to take the thoughts forward. Thank you, Ramanjit, and a big welcome to everybody who's here. 
uh, good evening to all those who are in South Asia and good morning, good afternoon to wherever else you're joining in from. Uh, yes, this year's uh, festival of Dramivazi is a multi-arts festival, which in itself is a unique thing. And uh, the theme of the festival is Accept, Change, Express. This theme has been gifted to the festival, uh, you could say, by the Youth Connect Brigade, uh, which is uh, another vertical wing of uh, the Creative Arts Academy, which has been recently launched. And we're very happy that uh, the, the whole, the foundation of this year's festival has been um, set, built by the young people at the TCA Academy. And in continuation, uh, taking that same spirit forward, uh, this today's webinar is one of um, the pearls in, in that necklace, uh, you know, of just bringing everybody together, um, irrespective of age, because a lot of work that happens for children and young people, there's still a lot of ageism in that and uh, a lot of young people stuck in the chasm between children and adulthood, childhood and adulthood. Um, so in that sense, Drame Bazi is trying to create a unique platform um, where we have things uh, for targeted age groups as well as for adults uh, belonging to the young people. Uh, because I truly believe that the adults belong to the children and the teenagers and not the other way around. So, um, because it is you who carry us forward. And um, we have a range range of uh, activities uh, and performances, uh, many which Ramanjit has already spoken about, but um, it's really coming together of a, a lot of people uh, from across the board. Um, making new connections and hopefully we will stay in touch and collaborate uh, in the future, in the near future, in the far future. That doesn't matter. This is a beginning and I welcome all of you uh, to Drame Bazi and um, promise to stay in touch. Thank you. I would request Abanti to play the Drame Bazi video now. Abanti, are you ready? if you could uh, take the introduction forward now. So, as you can see, there has been a lot of excitement about Drame Bazi. And uh, similarly, for the past few months, Youth Connect is something that has been on all of our minds on the TCA interns. And we are very excited to share this platform with the today's youth and to try and make it beneficial as well as fun for them. So since the beginning of the Creative Arts Academy, uh, it has been a space for the youth where they have been able to freely express themselves through various forms of art. Youth Connect is an initiative taken by some of the interns at the Creative Arts Academy to create a forum for the youth to discuss taboo topics and foster change through arts and intervention. Youth Connect aims to build a community that organizes group sessions and activities that are tailored to the interests of the youth. We intend to be a safe space for the youth where they can share their thoughts and be themselves. And we are an organization created for the benefit of today's youth. 
Um, on the same note, so today's webinar, as uh, Rowan Ma'am and Shelly Ma'am introduced for us, uh, we have our panelists talking about their experiences of diversity and inclusion in the different countries where they're from and the context that they reside in and the ways one can express themselves. Uh, it's about exploring one's own voice and the practice of inclusion, acceptance, and community building in the different spheres. And um, with this forum, we intend to bring an international collective of young theater makers to discuss and explore and express the diversity as artists. Thank you. I would like Pari to take this forward and introduce our panelists. Thank you, Kanjika. Um, our moderators for today include Joey Marcacci, who made his directorial debut in the Fish Project Play Festival 2020 with GPS and autoerotic comedy. He is currently directing the comedy Shit Train for the 2021 festival and will also be directing his own play guest speaker in the new play reading series. Last semester, he appeared in the Sidehi Diversity Project 2020 as part of the ensemble. He's a double major in theater and business administration, and on campus, he acts in various theatrical productions, does improvised comedy, and is currently working on bringing back the Muhlenberg ice hockey team with hopes of fall 2021 puck drop. He's extremely grateful and humbled for the opportunity to be a part of the leadership involved in bringing true change to campus. He's fully committed to making the Sidehi Diversity Project 2021 the most impactful and effective project yet. Lauren Caranda is a rising junior at Muhlenberg College. She's a double major in directing for theater and business administration. At Muhlenberg, Lauren was involved in lessons for an unaccustomed bride where she was the assistant director and lost, lost, lost and GPS where she was the stage manager. Lauren also serves as the event coordinator at Source Creative House in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania, USA. Lauren is currently working alongside Rouhani and Joey on the Muhlenberg College Sidehi Diversity Project and is honored to collaborate with, with such insightful and inclusive voices to make our campus community more equitable and inclusive to all. Rouhani Singh is a rising junior at Muhlenberg College, USA. She's currently pursuing a double major in theater and film studies. Along with these two art forms, movement is her go-to form of expression. Having been in theater for many years, she has performed in several performances, including 10 into 10 or The D. Cameron, Being the Becoming, the Creative Arts Academy's Beyond Borders, which was a part of the 8th International Theater Olympics at National School of Drama, India, a Midsummer Night's, Night's Dream, where she played Bottom, and The Merchant of Venice, where she played Shylock. Juhani strongly believes in using art and performance to tell stories that matter and inspire change. Our panelists for today include Vicky Allen, who is a Northern Irish actor and performance artist. Studying a level two and three extended diploma in performing arts, Vicky also completed additional training at Bruiser Theatre Company's Graduate Academy and Tinderbox Theatre Company's Play Machine program. Some credits include Teresa in The Shedding of Skin, Kabosh Theatre Company, Miriam in Consume Prime Cut Productions, Tutor in Dancing at the Disco, At the End of the World, at the Replay Theatre Company, and Villager 7 in Lucid Tinderbox Theatre Company, Star in Dirty Talk, No Touching Theatre, and Cara in Cara and Martin, BBC Bite Size, and 60s Model in Femme Fatale, BBC. Emmanuel Defo is a researcher, performance artist, and a choreographer of dance. In general, his works are based on a variety of movement systems in their emotive and material context and can be described as an adventure and search for the mater materiality of action, gestures, motion, and performance that underlies every human activity. He is interested in the body moving, body moving in space and the manipulation of unconventional spaces. Although his principal medium of inquiry is his body within a contemporary framework, there is a conscious avoidance of being bound by trends, fashion, or styles in the art world. This approach permits him an open, creative mobility and stimulates a vitality which stems from the body and movement, but goes beyond into the realm of photography, installations, and other strands of artistic representations. 
Suti Prachisya is, is pursuing a doctoral degree at the Faculty of English, University of Cambridge, as a Gates Cambridge scholar. She also writes poetry on the side, and her work has or will be featured in MOIDA Quarterly, Up the Staircase Quarterly, Claw and Blossom, The Rialto, Capsule Stories, The Seventh Wave, The Alipur Post, and Teva Magazine. Currently, she is contributing poetry editor at The Seventh Wave. Welcome. We're very excited to have you all here. Thank you so much, Pari, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and now we're ready to start this webinar. We're very, very excited to have um, young panelists from all around the world. And as we've already said, it's beautiful that such diverse communities can come across and talk about issues that matter to us. Taking this forward, I'm going to begin with the first question and then hand it over to my co-moderators, Joey and Lauren, to take the conversation further. So Vicky, Stuti, and Emmanuel, I think our first question to each one of you, and we can begin with in any order, but maybe Vicky can begin. Um, what does diversity mean to you? What does the word diversity mean for you, and how do you think it can be resonated with the youth community? Hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here. Um, diversity to me is difference of human and difference of, of everything, really. And it's great to see so many diverse people here today. Um, yeah, it's just celebrating difference, whether it be gender, age, ability in anything. And it's great to have it. And it's, it's really exciting to be a part of this today. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, Emmanuel, would you like to go next? Just share your thoughts. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good. Um, I think for me, diversity is basically recognizing the ways that we are different um, as a group, as individuals, as a team. And um, yeah, and um, sort of, um, committing ourselves to promoting that um, that difference, you know, both in a universal sense and in a particular sense. Very well said. Thank you. Stuti, you can go ahead. Hi, Rohani. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this. I'm sorry for the error on my end in joining this slightly late. Um, so, Rohani, to sort of address your question, I'm going to take I'm going to take a very different approach to the idea of diversity primarily because I'm thinking especially of diversity as we're using here in the context of theater and how that often translates into questions of representation and the idea of representing more faces, more voices, uh, more sort of experiences. And I think that the ways in which we use diversity or diversity of expression becomes awfully limited in the ways in which we are telling stories. So sometimes diversity translates literally into having, say, a racially or a gender diverse cast, but doesn't necessarily translate into those stories being told, or it doesn't necessarily translate into creating a space of, of not even accommodation, but of transforming how we're even assessing our own perception of aesthetics or theater or any sort of no or any sort of narrative or storytelling essentially where diversity is not simply about featuring people but it is about really changing our perception of what it is to hear a story or tell a story or what are the parameters within which we're operating our own idea of consuming or watching theater or any sort of performance really sorry for the slightly longer answer but i hope that that helps it does thank you so much for sharing so the um i think yeah what you articulated was just so well put together and it just gets the whole definition of diversity especially for us performers who are dealing with it in such various aspects um lauren joey maybe you can go ahead with the next question of course. Hi, everybody. It's good to see everyone. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Um, to continue our conversation, uh, the question for all of you is, how do you feel diversity is included in your major or minor um, and or job?
anyone could begin. Um, Ricky or Emmanuel or Stuti, whoever would like to begin could start. Sorry, can you just um, say the question again? I lost my internet. Yes, no problem. Uh, the question is, how do you feel diversity is included or possibly not included um, in your major or minor um, and or job? Ah, okay, fantastic. <laughs> um, I work as an artist, um, as a performance artist, as a choreographer, dancer. And um, yeah, and I, I think for me, um, I mean, there are two ways that I try to, you know, explore in just in my work and in my daily life, the idea of diversity. And one is, is to take a kind of um, ethical kind of overview, you know, which and I think in some sense, you know, all art has, I mean, personally should have um, some kind of um, ethical purpose and at the bedrock of this ethics should be, you know, how we treat each other, how, you know, we, you know, we explore the sufferings of others, how to, um, how to increase well-being per se. And um, so what I do in my work, basically, you know, when I think about how, you know, I project myself is to think about the ways that, you know, my work is either welcoming or unwelcoming to people who are different from me, you know, people who, who, who think differently, people who see the world differently. So in what ways is my work kind of welcoming or mostly unwelcoming to, to difference? And um, I mean, how, you know, I want to change that because I mean, a lot of 19th century literature and art can, um, they are testaments of how people can be interested, can use, can be interested in the arts of from other continents or from other culture or from diverse group, and there's and then still denigrate the people from you know whom this art is coming from. You know, anthropologists kind of you know with scorn can record you know record um, you know cultures from elsewhere and talk about your dance and their literature. And then still talk about the people like like animals per se. So, um, so in my work, I try to first of all consider the ethical side of how, um, um, yeah, of representation, how I represent myself, how I represent people, and um, my, and sort of still keep in mind my commitment to. Um, to the human community, you know, to morality and to the human community. And um, secondly, is in some sort of aesthetic sense, you know, which is basically being open to influence of space and of people from other places, you know, of literature from other places, of music from other places. So being open to, you know, to being influenced by, by music and dance and art from other places in my work while still maintaining a kind of partiality to where I come from, you know, a kind of partiality, of course, that is really important if you have to live, uh, say, a decent life in, in the universe. So, you know, I mean, while I keep myself open to these influences, to, uh, to yoga, to, to what, to all manner of art forms and musical from, from different parts of the world, you know, I still maintain a kind of bias to where I come from, you know, because I feel like, you know, in where I come from and in putting out where I come from, I am contributing in some sense to, to I'm, I'm making an important contribution to this universal part of, you know, of creativity and of art. So I think while, you know, you know it's important to, to, to embrace differences, it's also important to sort of um, make a commitment to, to the cultural spaces where, where we're coming from so it's both in an ethical sense of um like, like i said of um you know recognizing my my commitment to the human community and to morality in my work and also kind of being open in a partial sense to aesthetic influences from different parts of the world
Um, I think what I have to say picks off very seamlessly from Emmanuel. So I'll just sort of pick it up from there. So, I mean, of course, I'm coming here from two separate identities. One is as a PhD candidate in the Department of English, and the other one is um, as a writer myself. So with the first specific category, um, I'm constantly aware of the fact that the space that I am in, which is the University of Cambridge, has been a space of extreme oppressive power throughout the years, has been very instrumental in how colonization has taken place around the world in creating colonized thinking, in terms of creating or orientalized identities, in terms of being a center of power where white supremacy reigns to this day. So working in English in that environment is particularly interesting because any sort of attempt to decolonize, quote unquote, only feels piecemeal or only feels almost tokenizing in a certain way. So my work itself is very post-colonial. It is actually focusing on resistance poetry across the world. Um, so where my work stands, per se, is something that would not really qualify as legitimate work in the eyes of a department such as this one or in the eyes of any space of institutional power. Um, instead, my work would be seen as that token category of we are decolonizing, we are doing the work, we are getting this one brown person in the midst of a lot of whiteness, in the midst of a lot of white thinking as a person to contest these ideas that we particularly have. And the kind of structural support that is required isn't necessarily always there, barring maybe one uh, support system, maybe one supervisor, maybe even even when we go down to the basics of creating anything, which is the idea of providing institutional care or the idea of having systems that support and uphold you in a meaningful way so that you can produce to begin with. That doesn't really exist in a way that accounts for any sort of I mean, if you're using the word diversity, then diversity uh, of gender or race, or even the question of caste, especially the question of caste. Um, I'm also very cognizant of where I did my undergraduate training in uh, Delhi University at Lady Shiram College. Over there, questions of caste were only beginning to enter the fray. And it wasn't for the lack of people talking about caste or young Bahujan activists not speaking out. It was that they were systemically crushed in speaking out. We used to have these really brilliant things called the back row conversations, where uh, behind the gates of the, of the university, right behind where sort of uh, my college ended, a number of Bahujan students would gather and hold sessions and seminars every week. And the reason they had to do it literally outside the boundary of the institution is because the institution is not interested in hearing these conversations that question the existence of the institution itself. So in asking whether, you know, how it is represented in your major or your minor, it's a very pertinent question because on one hand, it is like these questions of marginalization and these questions of uh, subalternity or these questions of uh, decolonizing are a huge part of any kind of English curriculum or English education. On the other hand, the fact that it is included in the English department is an attempt to almost tame it or tame its possibilities because it is only acceptable so long as we're talking about it. But when it comes to actual action, when it comes to sort of like Emmanuel was saying, in terms of considering the people we are writing about, or the people we are researching as people and not simply objects or subjects of our own work, we are really lagging behind and we are honestly deprived by having this particular kind of uh, approach where we think of black people as quote unquote black bodies where we think of uh, caste only the context of resistance and only in particular kind of meters when we are interested only in hearing uh, voices of women so long as they are voices of women upholding ideas of whiteness in some way or the other so there is so much work to be done and i think the largest problematic in getting this work done is institutions that we otherwise socially would uphold, such as Oxford, such as Cambridge, such as any of the Ivy Leagues, really. So that that's my two cents on this. Yeah, thank you, Suti. And before Vicky goes on, I just, um, you know, want to even speak about, and maybe we can come back to this later, but I would love for Joey and Lauren to even share about the work that we are doing as Sadehi Diversity um, the Sadehi Diversity Project at Muhlenberg College, where we're studying currently uh, um, in Pennsylvania. And it's exactly this kind of work. It's about talking about the cause of diversity in our campus community. How is it that we're addressing the issues? And what are the things that the administration is not doing right? What are the things we need to call out on? And what are the things that 
we need to ask them to take into uh, their accountability. So um, I'm glad that you brought about the fact that these conversations are needed. And um, I wish more and more colleges have such projects and conversations where they can hear from the students what it is exactly where the diversity needs and what is it that we are actually asking for. Um, but we can come back to this and Joey can share more about his role as the director. But Vicky, please go ahead. Talk to us about your work. So, oh, one minute. Am I, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I am an actor and have been working professionally as an actor from I was maybe 18, but I didn't go the normal avenue of going to university or drama school or anything. So for me, it was always, not always, but I've been in situations before where I have been told that because I don't have that background of uni or anything that it's not a career path for me or it shouldn't be, a, it's not a professional job that I'm in because I haven't done the norm. Um, but I think I dealt with it okay whenever I was told that. But thinking back, you know, that to me is a huge opposite realm of diversity and it should be you should be feeling included no matter what background you have or no matter how you've trained and i have worked with so many great people and i i learn as i work and i learn through talking to people like you guys and talking to people who have experienced so many different ways of of exploring diversity and i think it's a great thing and and if i had the chance to go to uni and, and study that way i would have definitely done it but i am really proud of myself and my career and, and how I've how I've worked it by just being me and um, I think diversity as an actor is so essential but like Studi was saying um, you really need to practice it when you're in the room with people you can't just say we've got a cast of five different genders five different backgrounds five different religions you need to feel supported when you're speaking you need to feel listened to and you need to feel accepted and it's so great having a room of difference because you learn so much about people and you have agreements and you have disagreements but it's it's overcoming the disagreements and chatting in a civil way and learning about the way that people are and how we work and then exploring that through art is even more incredible because you just come up with some amazing things and I find no matter how different people are when you work in theatre there's always a similarity of wanting to create something magical and that's just incredible and that's why I, I I'm a part of it because I love being around people who celebrate difference but also want to make art in similar ways, whether it be through spoken word or poetry or dance or, or physical theater. Um, so it's great. And I always, always tell people how amazing it is because I have friends who work in not the arts, you know, those normal jobs, those nine to fives, and they are always complaining about the women don't get listened to or men or and all this. And I'm like, it still happens, but in theater, I feel you are accepted a slight, like slightly bit more. If you're a wee bit weird, you're accepted a bit more, which is great. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's really nice to hear, Vicky. It's cool to find common ground with diverse perspectives through like your love of the form. Um, so. First of all, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be sharing all of our perspectives today on a global level, especially after feeling so distanced for the last year. Um, so my question, my first question for all of you as young artists, but also just as young people as we are, um, where, um, like, or what are the differences that you've noticed in the arts community between activism on social media versus activism in person? And we can start with whoever would like to speak. Can I take this? Uh, is that all right? So Lauren, that is sort of the subject of my PhD. Um, so 
one of the most interesting things, I mean, there's lots to be said about it, but one of the most interesting things that I constantly hear about online activism is how it is illegitimate or how it is not as valid as protesting or, uh, you know, putting your body in the middle of of an actual active protest as is happening in person, so to speak. And when I'm saying the word protest, I also mean it in terms of producing stuff, because I mean, as any protest unfolds or any sort of active resistance unfolds or any sort of assertion of your own identity unfolds, um, it happens creatively, especially online. You are creating content of various kinds. You're sort of creating pictures and memes and art and uh, putting together very funny clips and so on. And there is a sense of one is inferior compared to the other, right? I take a lot of problem with that because I think if anything, the space of the internet allows more and more people to come to the front and more and more voices to come to the front in ways that are incredibly unique and incredibly imperative. And it expands what we even consider the idea of art or the idea of resistance. I mean, take the meme, for example, which is introduced essentially as a very funny form that, you know, you're supposed to laugh at. And it has been modified in so many ways and in such creative, authentic, performed ways, been taken away and adapted into like music at times, been adapted or like featured in films and so on because it was produced communally like you could automatically see how it resonates with so many people and the fact that there is a forum for us to be able to see not a perfect representation in any way whatsoever and of course there's a lot to be said about digital divides and the fact that in person you would experience maybe a different demographic than what you would experience online and there is a lot to be said about that i'm not discounting any of those factors but to necessarily say that any kind of resistance activity or creative activity that happens virtually um, is somehow lesser is inaccurate because if anything we have been able to even gather as a community from different spaces right now because this is taking place virtually effectively this particular conference and so on so how social media works is that we can connect in very amazing ways and at the same time i do want to add that it also continues the same lines of alienation that take place in person so the way that marginalized people are most likely to be affected in a protest most likely to face police brutality the same way marginalized people are most likely to be sort of called up or called out or like lose the job because they tweet something against the reigning government or uh, you know be thrown into jail because they created a particular comic and so on point being that regardless if it comes down to the essence of risk and the idea that art does something that is felt whether or not it's produced online or in person and so invariably i think that we need to expand our boundaries also in the in the light of covid as to what we see are the limits of the possibilities of the internet so yeah um yeah, I mean, I basically agree with what she had said. Um, um, what I'm going to add is that um, I feel like in some sense, I mean, not disagreeing with her, but just kind of stretching the conversation a bit, that um, um, what we've seen today with social media and activism also is um, a commercialization of, of activism in some sense that um, because it, it kind of disembodies a person from their opinion, you know, so you can have thousands of opinions floating around and then they are, you cannot pin, you know, what people believe in to the person who believes it in some sense. And um, so I, I feel there's, there's a kind of problematic in, 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 this, in, in this kind of, um, I mean, not, not really a problem, but there's, um, there's something really strange about this disembodiment because it's still the question of um, you know if um, one needs to understand the you know the ethical position of an artist you know before one can fully appreciate their work you know so I feel it's still the same disembodiment that um, the people who ask you know who said that um, the artist is dead in some sense, once the work is produced, you know, are trying to deal with, if one should, you know, separate the individual who's, especially in this age where, you know, people are speaking more as, as groups and, you know, not as individuals, if people should separate individuals and, um, uh, you know, in favor of the group in some sense, 
and um, I think this this with social media it bec it's becoming more and more pronounced and um, um, so it's easy to find people who say um, as a as a black person you know I'm, I I think you know this because um, nowadays it, it seems in this age that um, that that is supposed to cover for your for your for your opinion in some sense because we foreground the opinions you know instead of the individual and then we foreground in, in some sense the 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 community instead of the individual and I think more and more we should sort of clamor for a balance between these two the individual the community and then the opinion so that people are um, more likely to um to speak what they believe in some sense and not speak under the cloud of of a group people are more likely to speak what they believe to speak their mind to be more confident both online and offline to communicate you know their values and um i mean their values the changing of their values if it's if it's a flexible thing that they believe and um not hide in some sense you know behind group behind technology and um and um i think that's um that's quite important for artists to communicate i mean in dealing with social media you know that we don't get lost in 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 the technology in a way that um that that what we speak out doesn't really affect us in some sense because you know we are lost in in the crowd so i think in terms of activism and in terms of social media i think there has to be a really a strong balance between that when someone communicates their opinion, it's because they have, in some sense, ended through constant, um, um, through work, and um, you know, through, through, you know, through whatever means. But they, they should have, have have ended in some sense, and not just because they are part of a, or they are considered part of a group. Yeah, just what I feel. Thank you so much. Um, I think what you said just resonates with all of us trying to have and work with diversity in whatever we're trying to do. So thank you for that. Vicky, would you like to add anything? No, that's fine as well. Yeah, I think I think it was well articulated. Joy, you could go ahead then. Of course. Um, to continue the conversation uh, surrounding um, diversity also in um, theater making spaces and just entertainment in general, um, as theater or practitioners and performance artists, um, what are the signs you look for in rehearsal spaces that make you feel safe, accepted, and Sorry, could you repeat the question, please, Joey? Yes, as theater practitioners and performance artists, what are the signs you look for in a rehearsal space that makes you feel safe, accepted, and ah, I mean, can I go first? Okay. Yeah, I think basically, I what I look for is um, a place where they make me feel more and more myself in some sense more and more liberated and um, not places where um, people expect me to 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 perform in some sense you know an impression of me you know so i mean one of the reasons why in some sense when you know someone used when um, what, why I say this is because um, you know people think that most of the times when when you speak, the power lies on you who's trying to communicate. You know, and in in spaces that champions diversity, I think the they make this mistake in some sense with language when they say, uh, you know, he's speaking as a black person. You know, and I think that that or he's speaking as a, what, as a man, or he's speaking as an, as an artist. I think in that sense, when people introduce me like that, you know, or when people say we've made, um, 
we've made provision for for disabled people in some sense i think it is in a way creating a, a box of a box that is based on language with which we have been taught to think and talk about diversity and about inclusion in some sense so i i i'm really i really feel comfortable in a place where people are themselves uh, and where people give me the the freedom to be to be myself in the ultimate sense of the word that I can experiment, I can improvise, I can make mistakes, you know, in a way, and um, they can experiment with me. They can experiment with my beliefs. They can experiment with my with my ideologies, with my body. They can also be free to make mistakes, and um, yeah, a place where you know that diversity is. Um, it's rooted also in, in local practices, but it's also open to, to, of course, contributions from, you know, different, you know, regimes or different places, you know, different people, different individuals. So a place that makes me feel more and more of myself without having to, you know, pretend or to play into some sort of grand narrative of what um, you know, of what the language with which we communicate, you know, diversity um, is a place where I can truly, you know, sort of um, experiment and I can, yeah, actually leave it. Thank you. Um, I, I want to ask Vicky next, um, just on the same question, but maybe you could speak more about your work uh, in the shedding of the skin with Kabosh Theater. Uh, we also have Paula who's joined us and this is again we have a collaboration with the creative arts it's a british council project um with the kabosh theater and it's it's we're so excited and grateful to be a part of this collaboration but what would you like to say about maybe while making this project what is it that you think as a theater artist you would maybe feel or need to make the environment feel more safe and accepted or what are the what was the process like mm -hmm. yeah um just touching on the first question um i think i'm a wee bit slightly naive when i go into a process of the likes of a show or rehearsals because i don't look for signs to begin with i kind of go in expecting everything to be inclusive already and then if i notice moments of that not happening i guess that's when i'm kind of like okay this isn't right this isn't okay they're not being treated equally and then i would address that but with the shedding of skin um it was a piece written by a playwright called victoria kafula and it was directed by paula mcfetridge who runs kabosh and it was essentially four characters of different ages and different backgrounds different cultures different languages all everything and they effectively suffered similar experiences with conflict and violence and abuse and discussing that in rehearsals i learned a lot of it's okay to ask questions if you don't know what's going on because I would struggle a lot with with not understanding intellectual conversations so I felt so comfortable being able to just put my hand up and be like actually I don't really understand what we're talking about here and it, it was such an inclusive thing whereas I've been in situations before where I have been not able to speak up as much so it was making sure that everybody was on the same path and there was a lot of times where we would all just kind of go where are we right now is everybody okay because the pace was so heavy and but we always were there for each other and it was mainly women who were who were a part of the creative team we had a couple of men when we went to film the piece but for about four weeks we were just all surrounded by women and talking about issues such as sexual violence and abuse you know there was moments where we were getting a bit emotional so it was nice to have that support of i'm here i've got your hand i am listening to you and i can I, I i see you and i'm with you so that was lovely to be a part of and as well in the piece we have um a rape scene 
so we had um, an intimacy coordinator on, Paula O'Reilly, and it was great to just have that somebody there to make you feel safe, to make everybody feel safe, to just know that everybody is on the same path of comfort. And if the actors were getting a bit uncomfortable, that they could just take a minute and breathe, um, which is the first time I've ever been on a production to have an intimacy coordinator, which was incredible. And I think they should be it should be necessary on, on any job that includes any any intimate scenes for sure. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of diversity in, in the process, but we were all there for each other and it was an incredible journey. And I'm just so lucky to be able to even chat with you guys now through doing that show. It's it's just really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a theater practitioner myself, but um, as someone who watches a lot of theater and therefore is on the other side, um, I think what Emmanuel and Vicky said about, you know, the politics of care and the politics of trust and Vicky, I found the point that you made about having an intimacy coordinator so important and so vital and that again sort of connects to what is really curious or of interest to me when I'm looking at uh, the production house that is putting up a, a play which is where is the money going and i know we don't like talking about money in the context of the arts at all it is supposed to be above that and all of that stuff but women actors are notoriously underpaid trans actors are notoriously underpaid black actors are notoriously underpaid um think of any intersection so to speak and they are underpaid are you paying them at par as their white male counterparts are you doing things such as putting up ramps or putting up spaces of accessibility so that people with different uh abilities can access these spaces are you effectively trying to create a space monetarily which compensates say uh underpaid underfunded young interns to be able to actually come and and have conversations and put in their labor these are important questions that we have and things that get awfully sidelined because we don't like talking about money in the world of the arts at all whereas it is very much what pushes the world of the arts to be able to produce and to be able to actually create spaces where people can be artists full time really and focus on creating very meaningful work. So I think that is something that I personally really look towards whenever I am uh, sort of engaging with any uh, production. It's funny you bring that up, Studi, because my next question actually is specific to you and your work that you do. Um, I know you wear many hats, but I wanted to talk specifically about your work in writing and also it sounds like from your introduction that you've also done some editing work. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, as a writer, first off, um, what do you look for in a either a publisher or an editor that tells you that your unique and diverse perspective will be uplifted in that setting? Um, and then conversely, if you are editing another writer's work, uh, what metrics do you use to ensure that you're allowing their diverse perspective to shine through their work? So Lauren, thank you so much for that question. Um, so this is particularly interesting because this is all the questions that I was asked when I was getting the job at the place that I currently work at. And uh, the question being, of course, what do you look for when you are editing? Because, you know, as an editor, especially when you're editing poetry, you're entering with a lot of preconceived notions of what you think makes for good poetry, what you think makes for good writing. And it is so imperative to discard that entire perception and to constantly catch yourself in positions of bias. So one way in which I very tangibly can find that a space that I'm working with is aware that bias exists in any editor is that they have multiple editors for a single piece. Because the idea is, and multiple editors coming from different perspectives with different abilities, with different sort of backgrounds, for the purpose of looking at the same piece and looking at the same perspective and offering, uh, looking at the same piece and offering different perspectives. Because that's a very tangible way of determining that we are not perpetuating a single idea of being able to write or a single idea of being able to represent yourself and so on because we're working with in very experimental times and it is very interesting to see how people are using these experimental moments to create wonderful work so to walk into the space with expectations or the burden of the past or the burden of high literature versus low literature or whatever becomes something that is actually restrictive and not particularly useful. So that is something that I like entering as an editor. As a writer, what becomes really complicated is that I am the product of 
a post-colonial English education. Like it or not, I tend to speak in exactly the language in which I was educated, which was the product of a very, very colonized education system. So this means that I speak English in a particular way or I want to articulate myself in a particular way. And I'm constantly trying to look at my work and step back and think about how this work perpetuates these specific ideas of elitism or these specific ideas of power that are so entrenched in the ways in which we communicate. And that self-reflexivity is very difficult to grapple with. And I don't think I've grappled with it personally well enough. I think it is an ongoing process and I'm still trying to learn, which is why panels like this are very, very beneficial in sort of stepping back and re working or, or thinking of again what is the tangible thing that we can do how do we translate this moment of realization into action so yeah thank you Suti. um and i think i just want to say thank you to each one of you for just um bringing such pertinent perspectives that i think we all listen to and we're we're trying to work on it but I feel there's not enough conversation about the kind of work that we as young artists here are trying to do, whether it's in college or whether it's independent work. Um, arts is being celebrated and we're trying to work on diversity, but I feel it's a lot that the older generations um, and their work is being highlighted. And of course they have way more experience than we do, but just the kind of work we're trying to do at our age needs to be highlighted through these kinds of conversations. So thank you so much for sharing um, everything that you're doing. It, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. I would like to take this moment to just maybe um, ask Joey and Lauren to talk a little bit about the kind of work we're doing at Muhlenberg and the project that Sadehi Diversity is. So if you could, you know, just shed some light on what kind of work it is that we're doing through this project and what we hope to achieve. Joey being the director, maybe you could start with, yeah. Yeah, of course. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm the director of the Sadehi Diversity Project this year um, on Muhlenberg College campus, which is located in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, Muhlenberg College um, is a predominantly white institution. And so with that, the Sadehi Diversity Project was founded, I believe, in 2006 and has since operated um, with the intent being to uh, hear the voices of faculty, students, and staff who have specific questions um, or have specific stories um, pertaining to topics that would be considered taboo under um, the institution of Muhlenberg. And so what we do is we take the words of um, faculty and students and staff who want to be interviewed and use their words to actually put on a performance um, in which we hope to be provoking um, and uh, somewhat um, somewhat striking uh, to the viewers. Uh, all freshmen who come to Muhlenberg are required to see it in order to sign up for classes. And so in that way, seeing uh, the Sadehi Diversity Project in the first couple of days since they've arrived at Muhlenberg College really opens up the conversation immediately for um, the topics that do need to be discussed and that they should be aware of going into the college that we all love, but we know that there needs to, uh, there still needs to be work um, done in order to truly make Muhlenberg College a place where everyone feels it, it, everyone feels that the community is equitable um, and uh, a safe uh, community for um, everyone involved. Uh, Lauren, do you have anything to add? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, as Joey and I have both mentioned, we're really honored um, and to be working with Ruhani and all of our ensemble like has just been one of the most like transformative um, theater making processes I've ever experienced. Um, but it's strange, we've been having this conversation a lot lately about how we are, as artists and working in this project that happens every year on our campus, we've been empowered to speak freely about our institution and the problems within it. But we are at the same time financially supported by that same institution um, and the administration and departments that the students are calling out in a way. Um, so 
the structures on our campus that have been historically oppressive are the same ones like supporting this project. So it gets tricky from a credibility standpoint um, because as Joey mentioned, we are in this unique position where we are performing predominantly for the incoming first year students. Um, so we are embodying the thoughts and the feelings of current members, uh, like established members of our campus community, um, whether it be students, faculty, administration, um, but our audiences of perspectives from all over the country and world who have not yet fully assimilated into that community. Um, so we're hitting them at a very strange time, but um, I can say from now being on the inside of this work for the first time this summer, um, it feels really good to know that we, despite all of these different factors, um, we are giving the community an accurate re-performance of the exact words, thoughts, emotions um, being presented to us in our interview process. So it's been really reassuring and gives me a lot of hope to know that, you know, we are given the opportunity to have this platform and reflect accurate portrayals of how people are feeling on our campus. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, with this, I know we're almost towards the end of the hour, but I do want to take this opportunity before we have our audience members um, try and get distracted from their, because I feel like this just limited attention span that we have online nowadays. But before everyone cuts out to either eat lunch or dinner, whichever part of the world you are in currently, I would like to open it up to our audience members. If there's anyone who'd like to maybe switch on a camera and ask our panelists any questions, talk about any form or perspective of diversity, we'd love to hear from you. I do believe till then we had a question. Um, oh, okay. I believe Stuti has already answered it via text, but I just want to like maybe read it out. We we have a question from Bhai Baldeep Singh Ji, who is one of our senior advisory members, right? Would you like to ask it in person? Thank you for joining us. Sir, we can't hear you. Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't think you'll be able to read my question well, Rohani. So I'm trying, but uh, I wish so uh, this this is just for our audience members. I will leave G and I have this back and forth where we go about um, pulling each other's legs. But he's one of our senior advisory members at the academy. If you would like to ask your question. Yeah, I was just telling that uh, Lauren was just joking when she said she loves working with you. And Rohani said, how dare you? I said, because her earrings are dangling, not in sync, you know, with the Olympics <laughs> uh, in jeopardy. So anyway, that was uh, jokes apart. It's lovely. Thank you for the invitation, Rohani and Lauren, everyone. It's been an eye opener, actually, to to uh, even to witness uh, your contemplation and the, your, your discussion. Uh, your deliberations and and the topic is is very very important in terms of diversity i mean uh, and i really appreciated uh, uh you know emmanuel's uh, uh idea about when he spoke about the commercialization of even activism i think this is these are some very very important uh, we have to be like jealous mothers and fathers you know to protect that space where uh, we can be free to question uh and 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 scholarship is in the quality of questions uh and of course people who have a lot to hide would always be afraid my question uh to stuti uh, uh and i really i mean every one of you spoke so well um it was more to do with the uh, writing when she was talking about editing it spurred uh, there was something that she said about uh, uh, when editing other people's work versus her own, uh, when she's writing her own, and it sort of brought that uh, question to the fore. That, if I may ask her, how are you able to detach yourself when proofreading and editing other people's work, but then, uh, you know, drowning again uh, in the in the harvest that is of your own making, uh, that process of how you. Uh, you know, become that Mali, that gardener who's plowing within, planting the seeds and watering with with the nectar, etc. So how how do you how are you able to negotiate those two? That when you're writing somebody else's work, you cannot 
from as a lay perspective, lay person's perspective, from even seeing from far that you cannot be too involved. You have to be detached to be able to give even anonymous refereeing. You know that you do. And sometimes a writer wouldn't even know that it's you. Maybe you may be responding to Rouhani's uh, poems or Lawrence, anyone, Emmanuel's work, right? But if it is you're an anonymous referee, referee, they wouldn't even know. So you will have that freedom to question, to to ask collaborations. But then when you are um, with all that experience of editing other people's work, that also you take back when you are uh you know uh, diving deep into your own waters how do you negotiate that do you see that am i uh, correct in seeing that there are two different ideas and it's a great opportunity as well to go uh, to go uh, you know within and without <laughs> and uh, if you can kindly share your thoughts and respond to that will be very great thank you, so, thank you so much mr singh that's a very very pertinent question and a sort of answer it partially on chat, uh, but I'll elaborate on it further. So I fortunately have the very lucky job of not having to make selections, but having to do the editing work in my specific role. And the specific magazine I work with, which by the way, if any of you are writers, please do submit. We're open for submissions. Uh, the seventh wave works precisely in contextualizing each writer based on their own exposition of who they are and where they come from. And this reflects in many, many ways in the sort of diversity of the voices in which are included in our project, which means that people are often talking about how they have had say, unconventional parts in their lives, or they come from backgrounds that are not adequately represented in literatures and so on. But that selection process, I don't have to do. My part is really to, after the selection is done, to actually delve into the work and read it in the context of everything else that has been told to me. So I don't really go into work with sort of the idea of anonymity. And personally, I'm not a fan of the idea of anonymity. I think that contextualizing where someone comes from is a huge component of uh, writing, which is also very interesting in the context of theater, because traditionally in theater, you discard all notions of yourself and like really enter into character. But how can you discard notions of yourself if yourself has been someone that has always been marginalized? How can you discard notions of yourself if your black person will always be perceived as a black person, even if you're entering a role that is, say, racially neutral, quote unquote, so to speak. So um, I find that that idea very insufficient. And that is definitely something that I constantly use as an editor. Because again, like you said, there is that within and without process where as an editor, you have to sort of step out and have a view from above. I don't think that view from above is very productive. I think it has to be a view that is collaborative, that requires a back and forth with the writer, that requires a sort of deep, involved process. Because my own requires me to contextualize that I hold a significant power in India simply based on my class position, my caste position, the kind of accesses that I've had. Um, and that requires me to acknowledge that my work, while as much as I love it, is not representative of anything. It is representative of perhaps only me, and it is representative in some ways of this very specific idea that is still inflected by eliteness and is still inflected by a uh, colonial past, because that is who I also am. And I don't think there is any point in making any bones about it. I need to acknowledge this as a way of learning how to not perceive other work or other standards of writing or other perceptions of what art is with this gaze like acknowledgement is the first part of a larger process of unlearning and for my own work i'm still very much in the process of unlearning for my critical work i think i am getting closer to the point where i don't uh you know need to resort to traditional ideas of what is good and what is bad often very colonial often very separationist ideas of what is good and what is bad um to perceive other people's work. Sorry for this long answer, but oh, thank you. Thank you so time. much. Can uh, I have a, one quick follow up, if yes. possible? Yes, possible. Ruhani? Sure, sir. And then we can follow up with the next few questions yeah. that we have. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I represent the uncolonized India. So my ancestors never shook hands with the British. So just to add an idea to you, even in the academic field, uh, there's a lot of, you know, the post-colonial and then the decolonial uh, kind of a work which is going on. And I pushed back a few years back, but I said, but what about, is there a place for us, those who never were colonized, who fought, who were the resistance, 
and whose ancestors never shook hands and we have memories uh, even the sense of valor for example that we have is not fighting for example for the colonizers we have had many french to portuguese to british in south asia and uh, like goa and they were they were portuguese colonies so uh, but our valor where i come from is fighting against the colonizers so we we is a totally different idea one but uh, I, uh, the reason that my follow up was to do with the anonymity idea of anonymity I think one uh, other uh, panelist has also I think Lauren has written that Stuti's points about anonymity are so fascinating in conversation with Emmanuel's points about the issues that arise when social media detaches thoughts from the individual. So I'm just addressing to the anonymity uh, part when I mentioned, I feel uh, when we are looking at referee journals and others, anonymity, anonymous refereeing gives added freedom. So uh, at times there are writers who are known to you, but who may not. I mean, it is one capacity and ability, capability to be able to offer honest opinion. But it is not everybody's capability to to sort of withstand or to uh, float, um, remain afloat above a tsunami that comes calling, uh, you know, criticism or even uh, a pushback or even, you know. So I think I have felt with my own experiences writing for referee journals uh, and editing whatever little I have been able to do, that gives a freedom when the, when the writer doesn't know where it comes from and you give your honest, very objective opinion not to undermine or glorify anybody's work, but honestly. So I would still want to defend that space. Yes, there are people within our own space. When we write our friends, we do send our stuff for vetting, right? Can you have a look at it and respond back? So those people who we know will give an open opinion, but there has to be a space where an editor or a, uh, or a referee can have a place which is totally uh, private and where the person has a freedom to write um, um, that which is responsibly um, been the task that has been given and for the writer to be able to uh, then look at it uh, not knowing where it comes from but then look at it very objectively and respond to that and then of course that dialogue also occurs where you talk of partnership etc sorry for this longish uh, but no. if you have any thoughts i'll be very thank you so thank much you. uh thank you so much for sharing the deep uh Sudhi, maybe you could like share Can something yeah uh, and then because i, know I have one are. more question so um to respond to your question i am going to take a different stance from you i think i'm at opposition with you as rohani is at opposition with you i think in a different way um so here, I think that anonymity or the idea of objectivity that comes with anonymity is very questionable. I think the bias that creeps into the process of reviewing seeps in. Uh, so I'm speaking again from the perspective of also being an academic and therefore submitting to journals and being on the other side of the process and on the side of submission. Of course, there is something to be said about anonymity in that, you know, things such as where you like your, your university, for example, is not privileged over other things. And I absolutely concur with you there that that allows a certain space for that idea of falsified meritocracy to not perpetuate. But on the other hand, and this is where uh, the idea that there is an objective reviewer, in my opinion, doesn't really exist. Because often when, say, for example, if there is someone who's submitting from uh, South Asia and does not have the resources, the academic backing, or even the idea of uh, form or other sort of like, I mean, I just think back on my own experience as an undergrad in India and the utter lack of resources I had in time in terms of producing anything academic versus now where I have, I can literally send an email and get any book that I want in the world right now. Um, and it is a divide that exists globally. And to think that then you will be assessing this work that is coming from the center of power versus this work that is not adequately resourced, that is not ad adequately supported, and then somehow have an objective merit of it feels like a very difficult thing for me indeed. So which means that when you are reviewing work, you need to almost always be aware that there are contexts or at least have some degree of bias training to be able to undo those contexts and realize that things aren't um, 
that the idea of a meritocracy as we understand it doesn't really exist and the idea of objectivity or say a singular objectivity definitely does not exist which is why again like i mean you also raise this point about partnerships and the need for partnerships as a way of actually offsetting the review process becomes really really important um i think that this is a very interesting conversation we should definitely take it up later but i also don't want to take up too much time i'm sorry about that no, that's completely all right. I think this conversation is great and can be brought about later as well. Um, I just want to take this moment to maybe ask Vicky and Emmanuel the last few words that if you could help us with um, maybe answering Shelley's, Shelley Satyu's question on what are your thoughts on a people or community sharing its own stories versus sharing those of others? diversity, representation, appropriation, everything gets mud muddled up. And anyone could like Vicky, Emmanuel, Joey, Lauren, anyone who'd like to like take up this question, I'd love to hear some thoughts. Um, <clears throat> yeah, personally, I mean, um, I think when people talk about appropriation, um, it's not so much that the mean that, you know, people from other cultures and other contexts are, are sort of using cultural objects that come from um, their country or their, you know, I think basically they are talking about the, the way that it's, it has been used. So, I mean, as, as an artist, I really believe in sort of open mobility um, because I think some of the finest of human um, cultural products or culture, you know, pieces of cultural heritage that we have comes as a result of you know exchange and sort of um, you know collaborative use and experimentation with forms not just from where we come from but from other cultures so i think in terms of appropriation what i um what i what i think the problem is is how it has been used is it been you know used in a way that um denigrates the the people from which this um you know these cultures and these art forms comes from you know is it being used without um, with disrespect you know without giving like proper acknowledgement or i mean I, I think you know you know respectfully you know using cultural products from elsewhere sharing them appreciating them i think um yeah i think it's it's something that that is should be encouraged in a way i mean you know one thing that i don't want to see of course is nigerian art only in nigeria or nigerian people you know you know appreciating nigerian art themselves i think it's important that we share cultural products but i think in terms of appropriation what people are sort of you know i mean so cultural appropriation basically is, is a kind of confusing term for me because you know i think um it's okay to share cultural products i think the problem is you know you know how you use them you know do you use them with you know with you know with um, a kind of knowledge of the background where this you know, these art forms or these cultural products are coming from, or do you use them with a kind of total disrespect? And I think this is where the problem comes from. As long as we can reach, and this is for instance why I always sort of refer back to, to ethics when I, when I think about art and my work, because of course there are people who believe that sort of art and ethics, so morality, you know I mean? It's kind of old school for some people, but I think, um, um, it's always important to think about, you know, what are the implications of, you know, my using, you know, my putting out my work, my using the work of other people, you know, and how I'm using them. And um, it's always important to think about the ethical implications of, you know, of um, uh, cultural use and cultural, you know, borrowing cultures. But I, I think it's, it's okay to take cultures to to buy it in some sense as the same hip hop to take you know to get inspired to appreciate the culture and art from from other places but i think the the, the the most important thing is to think about how you're doing that and to do that in a way that is you know representative that gives credit to where the art form is coming from and that doesn't disrespect it yeah just going off um what emmanuel said totally totally agree um you need to give full respect to different cultures if you're if you're doing that for for theater um but here in northern ireland we see a lot of theater that is about the troubles that happened here and i think especially after a year of being stuck inside your house and not being able to go see live shows we want to see things that 
we are new to we want to see new new pieces of theater so it's totally totally celebrating that and um yeah that i just wanted to touch on that that creating difference is is great but also being able to explore your own culture is is incredible too and to be able to mix the both in a totally respectful way is is totally necessary i think in, in theater yeah very well said thank you um i would like to just take and ask lauren and joy if you have any last few words that you'd like to add and share I'd just like to thank um, Ruhani for offering um, this uh, opportunity to the Sabahi Diversity Project and for us to attend. Um, Lauren and I were so excited when you first brought this opportunity to us and it is really through the past hour or so. Um, it's just been so awesome to connect with so many of you from around the globe, which is um, so wild to me. And it's been such a pleasure talking to, talking to you all. Um, I personally feel um, more inspired now to go um, forth with uh, the Sadehi Diversity Project and really work to um, really work to um, create the work that I know that we can do with the project, especially hearing um, all of your perspectives today. So I really thank you. Yes, I mean, Joey said it all for me. So I will just say thank you as well. This has been so lovely and I really appreciate everybody's um, willingness to be vulnerable and to share your incredibly intellectual perspectives today. Thank you so much. Um, anything else that any of the other panelists would like to share the ending words? If not, uh, I just wanna quickly ask if any of our discussants are here and they'd like to um, share something, Rubani, Jashin, Sona, if you'd like to just share, we have like a few minutes and we'll pass over time, but it's such a stimulating conversation. I don't want to take from anyone's uh, moment of expression. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if anyone is here. Uh, I think Rubani is not, I think she got, they got locked out. No problem. Um, Vicky, Stuti, Emmanuel, anything last, any last words you'd like to share with our audience here? Just thank you so much for allowing me to be here and listen to you guys and meet and who knows what the future will hold. Maybe we'll all get to be in a room together at some point in the future. I would personally love that. And just listening to all of you has been very inspiring to me personally, just as a human. So thank you so much. And yeah, take care. All the best. Thank you. Um, anything else? Um, yeah. I it's um yeah really lovely to be here and um to sort of um listen to um all of the fascinating sort of insight and conversations and uh, i don't know something i want to just point out a bit about objectivity and anonymity i think because you're anonymous doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're objective in terms of criticism or in terms of editing you know anonymity just means that you know you're I mean, yes, you're not, nobody knows who you are or, you know, but I think that the, what objectivity for me really means is, I mean, whoever you are is to make plain the position from which you're speaking, you know? So if you're speaking as, uh, uh, you know, a person who comes from so, 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 and so background and this background, I mean, if with respect to the varieties of backgrounds that, you know, that we can think about, objectivity is basically, um, um putting it out when you write or when you did you know that this is my point of view and um this is the metrics with which i i am sort of um this is the position from which i'm speaking so but um that being said i'm kind of um super grateful that to be here and to Banti for inviting me and um yeah hopefully you know to connect with you guys in some other ways definitely i i resonate thought your same thoughts, Vicky and Emmanuel. I hope we can, um, you know, meet some point in whatever future and whatever space that comes together. Um, so thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. Um, I think it's been a delight having such diverse converse perspectives 
from such diverse countries and just bringing in your art form i believe this entire form of expressing so the exploring of diversities and then expressing them i think has been beautifully articulated through all perspectives and i think we've had a beautiful culmination i would like to personally thank for the collaborations that we've made here uh, i feel this entire panel has been brought about from different um, places like wiki has joined us from kabosh who's been a contact by paula mcfetridge stuti has joined us to paroma's contact who is right now currently volunteering with us at this uh, in our team emmanuel has come through abanti who is the program officer at the academy and of course lauren and joey are my friends from my college who are joining in from my ensemble so it's just it's just beautiful to see such collaborations taking place in this you know pandemic where we wouldn't even have thought of coming together but i do hope to see everyone in person maybe somewhere in the future thank you so much to our audience uh, to our senior advisory members our co curators of drama bazi for hosting this and letting us hold this conversation for the youth and by the youth and um yeah i would just like to take this moment to say that drama bazi officially we've had three beautiful webinars as part of the international arts summit but drama bazi the entire festival is beginning tomorrow uh, officially with the first workshop we have immensely taken time and effort to create this festival for the young and it's not just youngsters but anyone from age 5 to 30 and it's uh, we we keep saying these few things again and again so most of our lives and webinars have this either shelly ma'am or raman ma'am keeps uh, reiterating this but we have so many countries and artists and i just feel it's such a great celebration of the arts uh, for people to come together given the circumstances so please do join us and especially in the open discussions we have this beautiful screening of a uh, award winning academy award winning film tomorrow called innocente and it's it's just an amazing film it's a you it's from a us based company called shine global and it's a documentary on this young girl innocente who uh, was a homeless girl but she formed her she found her form of expression through painting and art and it it, it just makes this film made me cry and i hope Uh, we have audience members joining in from everywhere just to look at this entire topic of homelessness and how homeless children are maybe treated in the united states but also all parts of the world like what is it that's happening to them and how do they uh, find happiness and we have many such events joining in from australia and um, do join us but i'd like to end it over here thank you so much once again please stay tuned and thank you to our panel for joining us Thank you Hani, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you everyone. Bye bye.